My name is Laura Rosella. I am an associate professor of epidemiology in the Dalalana School of Public Health. I lead one of our interdisciplinary research clusters focused on advancing the use of data sciences, artificial intelligence, and emerging technologies in informatics to improve population health and health systems. In addition to the research and training initiatives that our cluster is working on, we wanted to create a space that in parallel could host discussions that will advance critical issues, such as the one that we will be speaking about today. First, we wish to acknowledge this land in which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Welcome to this important dialogue, Big Tech, Data Science, AI, and the University. What's at stake for Black life? As someone who works in the population health and data space, I know there are gaps in our work, particularly when it comes to factoring the context in which we work, such as colonization, capitalism, and white supremacy. Many have felt this gap in our discipline and in the broader discourse we participate in, which is why these discussions are so important, and they must be led by leaders in the community. That's why I was so excited that Lana James was willing to organize and speak at today's event. Lana is a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto, Faculty of Medicine, and you will hear more about Lana after the keynote. But I do want to start by thanking her for curating this event. She is always pushing for dialogue that is informed, that honors history and context, and that is accountable. I also want to flag that the goal is to have an in-depth discussion about these complex issues, and this will feel difficult and challenging for those who are just starting to come to terms with the implications, and also for those who have carried the burden of these issues for a very long time. It's also important to note that these conversations will and must continue after today. In terms of the structure this afternoon, we will be starting with a keynote from Professor Ronaldo Walcott, who I will introduce in just a moment. Ronaldo will speak for about 35 minutes, after which there will be a moderated conversation with the esteemed panelists, Ruha Benjamin, Lana James, and Pat Ocampo, who will be further introduced after the keynote. This event is being recorded and will be later available on the DLSPH YouTube channel. Our moderator will be Joanne Osetum. Joanne is a Dalalana School of Public Health and PH alumni, public health researcher, and organizer. Joanne is a founding member of the Black Public Health Collective. The collective is a committee to cr committed to working on critical public health practice issues rooted in principles of social justice, system transformation, and Black well-being with a national mandate. You'll meet Joanne right after the keynote, and she will also introduce the rest of the panelists. So without further ado, I'm thrilled to announce Dr. Ronaldo Walcott, who is a professor of Black Diaspora Cultural Studies at U of T. His research is founded in a philosophical orientation that is concerned with the ways in which colonialism shapes human relations across social, social and cultural time. He focuses on Black cultural politics, stories of colonialism in the Americas, multiculturalism, gender and sexuality, and public policy. He's the author of several books and scholarly works, such as Black Life, Post-BLM, The Struggle for Freedom, Black Like Who, and Queer Returns. Dr. Walcott has two highly anticipated books being launched in the next few months. The first, called On Property, coming out in February, explores the long shadow cast by slavery's afterlife and makes an urgent plea for a new ethics of care. In April, the Long Emancipation will be published by Duke University Press. In this highly anticipated book, Dr. Walcott posits that Black people globally live in the time of emancipation and that emancipation is not freedom. 
He takes examples from around the world and argues how the potential freedom has been thwarted, which he terms the long emancipation. That is the ongoing exclusion of black, potential black freedom and the continuation of judicial and legislative status of non-being. Please welcome our esteemed keynote, Dr. Ronaldo Wal Walcott. Thank you. Thank you, um, Professor um, Rosala, um, for the lovely introduction. And thank you to my co-panelists, Lana James, Pat Ocampo, and Ruha Benjamin, um, and to jo Joanne Osetum, who has been organizing us. Um, it's always, it still remains for me um, a really deep pleasure when anyone invites me to speak about the things that I'm thinking about or working on. So thank you for this invitation and thank you to the audience for showing up. What I'm going to present might be a little bit idiosyncratic because I am drawing on two kinds of strands of thought that I've been thinking a lot about and um, and trying to articulate. And um, in, in, in trying to do that, um, in this one talk might be a little bit of a matchup. So please bear with me and hopefully in the Q&A and discussions that follow, some of the strangeness of it might become clearer to you. Um, okay, I'm, I'm gonna get right into it then. The fully understand calls for race-based data in the Canadian context requires understanding something more than science, technology, research design, statistics, and all of the mechanisms used for extracting information and its correlation into data. It calls for a fuller understanding of the foundational regimes and orders of our society. And to do so, we must first grapple with transatlantic slavery and what it has bequeathed us. Slavery was not only crude extraction from the land, it was obviously also extraction from the African or black body through captive labor and other practices that became the foundational scaffolding of our modern societies. Without what is learned and accomplished through slavery in the Americas, we simply do not have the kinds of societies globally that we presently have. For many, that is a truth too difficult to assimilate. Nonetheless, it is the truth. I'm not an empirical researcher. I come to this conversation as part of an intellectual debate concerning ethnography, statistics, theory, practice, and so on, because despite claims about evidence-based research, evidence of what counts as evidence always remains suspect, in dispute, and are celebrated as some kind of access to truth. I trained in a department, I trained in a department where this debate about evidence um, was best exemplified by, by three scholars. David Livingston, who for many years did a longitudinal study of, of class in Ontario and Toronto and sometimes across Canada. The work of the great and renowned feminist sociologist, Dorothy Smith. And then we had somebody like Edward Harvey who did work on behalf of the police and particularly on behalf of police unions. Um, all three sociologists, all three taking radically different approaches to what it meant to do sociological research. And that, that, that debate alongside of many others um, shapes how I come to these questions. And in the context of what counts as truth, Black people's truths are most often denied and are rendered totally unbelievable. In reality, what we call evidence only becomes evidence dependent on whether or not it fits a number of cultural and ideological frames and reproduced or perpetuates those frames as legitimate. Evidence then is not self-evident despite the claims we might make for it. And evidence-based demands are themselves ideological claims too. 
And I hope maybe I can say a little bit more about this later. So the question of what counts as evidence is one that Black people, Indigenous peoples, and other people of color experience intimately. Most often, we are unbelieved. And by that, I mean that when we speak of our experiences, the evidence of our lives, the evidence of our lives, the result in majority white dominated societies is one of disbelief. Or what the African American novelist and essayist Ishmael Reed has termed the alien experience of Black people. Because the reception of our experience is greeted as if otherworldly, an alien experience. Relatedly, the history of what we call objectivity is particularly a difficult one for Black people, too. A people who were once considered not human, less than human, and subjected to a range of practices from transatlantic slavery to the most vicious forms of colonialism imposed on them in the Americas and on the African continent, objectivity is always for Black people positioned as a buttress against what we know and what is validated that we and what is valid and what is not I'm sorry and what is not validated that we know by those who hold institutional power. Indeed, because of this history, black people have an antagonism and suspicion of claims of objectivity, given that often for us it has simply meant white dominance and white supremacy, coupled with at the outermost limits, our dismissal and even our deaths. In short, our reality is deemed non-objective, what we live and what we experience. And in the context of what counts as evidence as objective knowledge that Black, um, black people, that Black people haven't been experiment, experimented on, refused treatments, and subjected to a range of conditions in which the evidence used or claimed in one way or other that we were deserving of what transpired um, has also served to produce for us a healthy skepticism of, for example, the health industry and its various and multiple claims made on behalf of life until proven otherwise. For example, if the COVID-19 vaccines will allow this kind of skepticism, skepticism is making the rounds, only forcing us to recall the history of abuse, the history of the abuse, and to justify why Black people might be simply hesitant about the vaccine. History repeats, as they say. And of course, the university as an institution plays a significant role in the skepticism. The university and the knowledge it has generated has been foundational to the long durée of Black struggles to claim ourselves. Race science, philosophy, medicine, sociology, anthropology, psychology, public health, all these and more have produced evidence and objectivity as most towards pathologizing Black people and rendering our lives less than. The university and its reign over what counts as legitimate knowledge is thus a site of Black struggle and resistance and a site that, black, and a site that political desires seek to transform into an altogether different possibility. To, a, to be a Black scholar in the university is to experience both its hostility to Black life and to confront it for what it cannot perceive Black life to be, both past and present. I bring to this conversation then an understanding of the university as an institution, that, as an institution that Black struggle attempts to transform. Sorry, I bring to this conversation then an understanding of the university as an institution that Black struggle attempts to transform and, and one that Black struggle also has to contend with. And I'm keenly aware of how the university's unequal distribution of resources seeks to render critique of it mute by awarding certain positions while rendering others not valid or legitimate. Knowledge then is contested to reign for the engaged Black scholar. The neoliberal corporate university makes that terrain even more difficult, given the small number of Black scholars working inside of it. So when we speak of evidence and truth, Black people bring a strong and healthy skepticism to it. And so too with something called research. We do so because we have historically 
and presently seeing both evidence and truth deployed in using ways that do not engender justice for us. And we have been quite often the objects of research used against us, not to benefit us, and to render us as not desirable for life. John Francois Leotard reminds us that, and I quote, scientific knowledge does not represent the totality of knowledge. It has always existed in addition to and in competition and conflict with another kind of knowledge, which I will call narrative, end quote. It is exactly the idea of narrative or another account of our collective present, but from the place of, of the from but from the place of the subaltern, from the place of blackness, that I engage this question and our concern about the datification of our lives. To put it another way, what we have come to call evidence-based decision making is an ideological turn that seeks to still maintain power largely in the hands of the world's minority, the North Atlantic, or to put it colloquially, white people. Let me quickly remind you that the Canadian Academy has long played a role in the technological and communications expansions, expansionist project of the Canadian state. The work of Harold Innes on shipping, on shipping, communications and logistics and his student, Marshall McLuhan, on media communications and literacy are a case in point. If you read their work, Canada is largely constituted as a white nation with a disappeared indigenous population only to reappear in anthropological form. What I'm trying to stress here is that the university has always been embedded in economy. This is its ongoing, and this is its ongoing readjustment too, that of the datification of our lives. So what does all this have to do with big tech, data science, and AI? The short answer is that none of it is possible without the university. The university is its foundation. Thus, I'm increasingly distressed to note that in some places in Ontario, especially concerning what you, we euphemistically call race-based data, that those making the case to collect it seem to think that this collecting, that seems to think that this is collecting the stories of exclusion and marginalization and then using it to fix problems. The naivety of the request or the demand, the apparent lack of political acumen, and the sheer willful ignorance, which is a particular kind of knowledge as Sigmund Freud has taught us, reveals an altogether different story. So let me turn to the university scene here, both local and national. We have been firmly since at least the 1970s, living in the information age, the information economy, the technological age, the tech economy, the, the digital era, a time where the North Atlantic and a number of other adjacent economies and societies have now most, have now most mostly, but not exclusively, moved from industrialization, manufacturing, and extractive industries to trading in information and new modes of non-material extraction not immediately tied to raw materials and the monetization. Of course, this is not absolute, given Albert and Jason Kenney's continued argument for extracting the dirty oil sands, but that is another story for another day. The transformation of the industrial age into the information age and the data economy is what now holds Western hegemony in place globally. If we could characterize this hegemony in a shorthand form, one would say that it is largely characterized by the rise of Silicon Valley and its monetization of information represented by computing and the redissemination of the computing information it has secured through collecting, collating, and importantly, holding proprietary control over knowledge gleaned from our bodies. The body is the ultimate site of extraction in the information economy. The universe is the link between our bodies and the technological economy too, training us for it, providing the research that fuels it, incorporating the products of it back into our labor and our studies and so on. Coupled with the neoliberal economic and cultural revolution with its claims of efficiency, 
managerialism and administrative governance. The information economy places the university as central to its order of knowledge and economy. Bill Reddins has pointed out that the university transformed itself from a national cultural institution concerned with quote unquote culture to one concerned with quote unquote excellence. And he further points out that excellence does not do what we think it is doing and that this transformation correlates with the nation state's decline as the producer of something called culture. I add to Redden's insight the impact of the post-industrial condition. Of course, post-industrialization does not mean manufacturing industry disappeared, but simply relocated to other geographies where it could be more cheaply produced through a range of free trade deals and international governmental and extra governmental global and, re and regional agreements, not to mention wars, coups, and other forms of political interference meant to maintain Western hegemony. And it's important to also note that while much manufacturing has now relocated to the once peripheries of the globe, that manufacturing dependent on advanced technological innovation remains firmly in the West. In short, not everything was offshore. One cannot recount this period as I'm doing in capsule form here without noting the information age is accompanied by the neoliberal economic claims of efficiency, managerialism, and free market imperatives. Neoliberalism was most firmly ushered in in the 1980s with the Reagan administration in the USA, Margaret Thatcher in the, in, in the UK, Chancellor Cole in Germany, Brian Mulroney in Canada, and, ex and expedited by the Cretan liberals of the 1990s, and the other members of what was then called the G7, and now transformed into the G20. Closer to home, the first and now revised iteration of the NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement between Canada, the US, and Mexico is one aspect of, the, of that new reorder at the time, now called the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement in the era of Trump, which was renewed in 2018. Similarly, the emergence of the euro currency, um, a common currency for members of the European common market, and the expansion of what was then called the European common market into the regional and expanding supranational government of uh, the European Union beyond the individual nation states of uh, its initial economic union. That has also now slightly retracted with Brexit, with the UK leaving. And of course, the emergence of China as both a manufacturing, importantly, superpower, and its transformation now into a technological, economic, and monetized power have shifted global relations since the 1970s. The full emergence of the information age and its economy then is and was not inevitable. It was imagined, nurtured, and made possible by policy, de policy decisions, local, national, and international. And in so doing, it also kept certain global arrangements in place, in particular, privileging the already wealthy West as the site of knowledge production, and therefore grossly benefiting from the information and data mining, not unlike the earlier extractive industries of the recent past too. Indeed, the very principles that underwrite European global expansion post-1492 or post-Columbus, including the colonization of the Americas, are the same, are the set same principles that underwrite North Atlantic information economic orders with a few adjustments and exceptions for the BRICS, and that would be Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and the Asian middle economies like South Korea. Free trade agreements facilitated the planned migration of knowledge producers, many of them residing in the universities and then moving across universities and the tech industries in places like Canada and the USA. In places like Canada, the university sphere was largely remade through these knowledge producers movements. At the University of Toronto, for example, this happened largely through recruitment from the USA. An ethos, that the current, an ethos of the current university largely structured through its global claims as an international rankings and a seeking of excellence requiring it 
requiring that it recruits internationally. But there is not, but there's, but there is no real proof that international requirement correlates to the recruiting of the best. What international recruitment is better at achieving is a standardized labor force by inducting its members into the hegemonic way of doing things. And it, I, I'm going to try to avoid getting too much into the weeds about how this happened at U of T. But if people remember um, the, when Shirley Newman arrived from um, Michigan in the late 1980s, early 2000s, or when Robert Bergenau arrived, who then in the middle of his term left and went to Berkeley, you see the building of this dynamic in, in the Canadian context. Um, I'm definitely not gonna get through everything that I have to say. <laughs> I can see it. I'm at 10 minutes and I still, and I haven't read half of what I have. Central to the central to the central to the contemporary dominance of information economy is the emergence of the global university. Many would say the USization of the university. Universities are foundation to the knowledge economy and not just as sites of training, as it's obviously easy to see but as contributors to the maintenance of local, national, regional, and in international competitive edges. Some of you might recall what was once flouted as, and now seems like an abandoned idea of the GTA and its outer regions, along with Buffalo becoming a super regional authority, all anchored through universities and colleges and other regional authorities to cement economic power in this part of North America. These kinds of formations are about securing economic power through the exploitation of dense populations, which can be data mined for all kinds of information for all forms of new industries in the information age. If, Jean if John Francois Leotard in the postmodern condition first published in French in 1979 and in English in 1984, in diagnosing the new economy, the new knowledge economy noted that, quote, Science has always been in conflict with narratives. And, and he continues, then we are now in a moment where science is the narrative. Leotard's text was written as a report for and presented to the Council of Universities for the Government of Quebec at the request of its president in 1979. Leotard notes, and I quote, knowledge in the form of an informational commodity indispensable to productive power is already and will continue to be a major, perhaps the major stake in the worldwide competition of power. Of course, Leotard's predictive powers are on point here. And it is without a doubt that knowledge or information is the defining commodity of our era, at least in the North Atlantic, but globally as well. Since the 1970s, we have seen and witnessed a consolidation of the university and the remaking of it too that intensifies the role that universities play in North Atlantic economies. Central to this role has been what we now call the global university. The global university is recognizable in a number of ways, but a chief way to spot them is through a series of international rankings and, indi and individual universities places on those lists and how those lists begin to circulate as a significant marker of quality and prestige. Those within the top 20 and then again the top 10 are often understood as contributing well beyond the national scene of their geographical location to a global project of higher education. What is left unsaid is that the project is one of the reproduction of capital and its primary location in the West. International rankings have worked to make universities very similar. Even in the global South where the extractive industries still reign, Universities have fallen into a predictable line that mirrors that of the North Atlantic. The global university is also characterized by its multicultural and multiracial constitution, its claims about social justice, democracy, freedom of speech, gender equality, and so on. And crucially important, its commitment to producing knowledge that will transform our lives across all spheres and not just the sciences. So the humanities and the social, and social sciences are inducted into this too. The significant silence about this, uh, uh, the significant silence about this is important because professors, one of the largest labor constituencies in the global university, largely continue to remain blinded about their implication in the production of the lives that we lead. 
We see ourselves as pursuing our individual research interests and believe it is fortuitous when what we work when what we work on connects the economy and so on, like if we are outside the economy itself. This foundational myth of the professorial class was to retain global North Atlantic hegemony, and yet we know that, and yet we know different. Or put another way, the people who run our universities at the highest administrative levels know different. So here is a few things that we might consider in the context of how this has worked itself out in Canada. Um, for instance, the Canada Research Chairs established in 2000 were meant to stem what was at the time described as a brain drain. Um, what the Canada Research Chairs wrought was uh, a panoply of other kinds of chairs like early research chairs from the Ontario government, just a, a network of chairs that had to be developed within universities to be competitive among each other, but also to, to demonstrate this fable thing called excellence. Um, the proliferation of patent offices, patents and reporting, and reporting mechanisms for faculty um, that ask us to list in activity reports whether or not we had produced any products in the, in the last year that might be patented and so on. A, redo, a revolving door between government and industry and the university at the highest administrative levels. The establishment of organizations like the U15 group in Canada, um, which is an organization of 15 quote unquote research intensive universities that claim to garner 80% of, of the funding, 87% of private research grants in Canada and so on. And the constant remaking of the tri-councils um, for efficiency, but also the ways in which the tri-councils are remade as they also direct what is possible for, for research through special teams, special pockets of money and, and so on. Um, and so researchers like to think that they're generating their own research interests and topics, and they often don't think about how those research interests and topics are being actually generated for them. Um, and then the scientization, what I call the scientization of all areas of the university. And you see this most forcefully um, through um, things like the digital humanities or through things like qualitative data analysis software in the humanities and social sciences where people begin to want to ma mimic the hard sciences in certain kinds of ways. And I'm not, I'm being a bit reductive in this moment because I, I, I'm going to run out of time in like three minutes and I'm nowhere close to how I wanted to conclude. Okay, so what we might call shorthand academic entrepreneurship is also a significant part of this dynamic that I am speaking to. So um, all of this that I just spoke about from the 60, from the 1970s to the 2000s, all of this is accomplished by the early 2000s, making universities a fully networked mode of the knowledge economy. At the same time, individual researchers continue to believe that they are driving their own research programs. That we as professional researchers, that we as professional researchers are now made technocrats of global capital is difficult for many of us to swallow. We rather retain the fantasy of our individually generated research agendas and projects that independently follow our own curiosity, um, idiosyncratic modes of being and our sense of discovery. Unfortunately, this is far from the truth for the majority of funded researchers. Okay, I'm because I'm running out of time, I'm going to slip past a whole series of conversations about the problem of data and move towards a kind of a conclusion. Um, so, but just let me let me say this. John Francois Leotard's The Postmodern Condition that I mentioned earlier, a report on knowledge, was commissioned at a moment when the still lingering effects of the student uprisings of 1968 in the North Atlantic offered a serious and sustained challenge to the failures of the representative democracy and capitalism. Joined in part by the civil rights and black power movements, that what was then called again the lesbian movement and the women's movement and independence and anti-colonial movements of the global South, Western hegemony was for the first time seriously pushed to a limit. The university stepped in or was deployed to help in turning the flame of revolution down 
quite a notch by incorporating into it many of the representative dissidents as both students and professionals, and importantly, as forms of study into its polity. What I'm pointing to here is that the university is neither a place of innocence nor an autonomous institution outside of the political sphere. When we understand the university in this fashion, its complicity already its foundational place in the information economy helps us to better, helps us to see better how to unwork it. Okay, so I have a, less than a minute left and I just want to, um, if you would, if you would give me three minutes, I'll get I'll, I'll 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 move towards a conclusion um, that I think will fit with what Lana particularly wanted me to do. The information economy is yet another transformation of global economic and cultural arrangements. At the moment that trans at the moment that transformation continues to privilege the people residing in the geographies that initially benefit from, from benefit the most from post-Columbus European expansion. Stuart Hall provides us a way to make sense of the conjuncture we're currently at, and I quote from Stuart Hall, a conjuncture can be long or short. It's not defined by time or by simple things like a change in time, though these have their own effects. As I see it, history moves from one conjuncture to another rather than being, rather than, rather than being, rather than being an evolutionary flow. And what drives it forward is usually a crisis when the contradictions that are always at play in any historical moment are condensed, or as of Susser said, fused in a ruptural unity. Crises are moments of potential change, but the nature of their resolution is not given. It may be that society moves on to another version of the same thing, Thatcher or Major, or to a somewhat transformed version, Thatcher or Blair our relations can be radically transformed, end quote. At this conjuncture, where naked brutality represented for true police murder, illness experienced through COVID and HIV and other diseases plague Black life inside global capitalism that has relegated us to the geographies of poverty, Black people are both wasted and simultaneously needed for the extraction of data. The moment can seem dizzying, calls for race-based data must grapple with the dynamic of waste and extraction because it continues to treat the black body not radically different from the experience of enslavement. At this conjuncture, black people too are investing in the representative politics of participating in the exploitation of black life. Joy James has cautioned us that, that progressive black intellectuals must, and I quote, may be judged not only by what we say, but by what we do about injustice, end quote. And she further says, and that means taking risks with non-elites. So the idea of the black test that myself and Edel Abdullahi attempt to articulate draws from a similar sentiment as James. We are concerned that policymakers and the policies they implement do so with an eye to changing the conditions of the most marginalized among us. If the policy does not alleviate the conditions of the most oppressed among us, then it fails the black test. By that, we mean that the ultimate measure is what happens not for elites, not even for middle classes, but for those whose position is on the cusp of both waste and super exploitation. Their status is in their status is in the face of, of policy implementation. The, their status in the face of policy implementation is the match of transformation. In a post-1989 world, the fall of the wall, wall of communist Europe and the global economy, there appears no viable economic alternative to capitalism for many. And so we, for met many. And we find ourselves at a special conjuncture in this moment in the university. I've been suggesting that the corporate university is the linchpin in the information age and that our complicity with treating our labor as merely following our intellectual interests of discovery is deeply flawed, if not right, outright dangerous for those who are governed by and through our contributions. The university as an institution sits at the epicenter of how data has been extracted, transformed, and repurposed for commercial and thus for, for, for commercial and thus for the perpetuation of unequal exchange and access to resources. 
the universities, that's one site where the struggle over data and its continued reordering of our lives must take place. The work that scholars like Lana James, through her Benjamin, Sophia Noble, and many others are doing is meant to get us to see this scene more clearly so that we might do something that once and for all breaks the still deepening accumulative effect and impacts from transatlantic slavery to the present. You see, many of, you see many of our universities were not simply founded from the proceeds of slavery and colonization, but the very logics that led to slavery and colonization continue to underwrite what and how we do what we do in the university. Black people are the inconvenient truth of the university and capitalism writ large. And our task following Sylvia Winter is to undo the narrative condemnation of black people and black life where the university has been a primary site of production for black people's subordination. I thank you for your time and your patience and I'm sorry I rushed through that. Thank you, Ronaldo. Thank you so much. And never, you never have to apologize in terms of your timing. Could definitely listen to you uh, for a lot longer. Um, so I also want to take this opportunity to welcome everyone to our conversation uh, this afternoon. As uh, Dr. Rosella mentioned, um, uh, my name is Joanna Sechum. I am the panelist, or I'm the moderator uh, for the discussion with our panelists later on. Um, and just wanted to provide a little more context about what's uh, going to be happening moving forward. And then um, we'll go ahead and introduce the panelists. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Ronaldo. I think there were so many pieces. And really excited to hear a little bit more about, um, you know, what uh, the discussants have to say in response to your comments. Uh, but I wanted to pick up on a few pieces uh, in case um, those joining us um, may have missed some of your comments, uh, particularly, you know, your comments just around um, um, the movement of knowledge across borders, uh, as well as just how universities have been connected for a very long time um, to the economy and also being on those sites um, of, uh, of oppression for Black and Indigenous folk, and that the university is an instant in this. And I think we really need to hold that um, to the forefront in this moment. And I want us to be able to think about the multiple realities uh, that, that do happen. Um, and we need to acknowledge um, the relationships that we have. And you know, for me today, I am joining from Treaty 13. Uh, which is the traditional land of the Haudenosaunee and more recently of the Mississaugas of the Credit. And I want us in this discussion to be thinking about um, the original stewards, the original protectors of this land, of the water, of the air, and really how um, we have been able to do the work we do, even to have these conversations um, as a result of the sacrifices that were made. And so really, um, want to stand in solidarity uh, with uh, First Nations, Inuit and Métis um, people, uh, realizing, you know, universities as well have a long history and sometimes troubled history uh, uh, with these communities. And so in terms of format, um, I just want to give a little more information about that. Uh, so we have five questions that we're hoping to get through uh, with the discussants today. And have about two minutes um, to respond and then we'll have a few minutes uh, for just conversation between uh, between the panelists as well. Um, do you want to mention that we do have a chat function going on so we encourage those uh, people attending uh, to you know have your comments um, in the chat. We will be watching the chat and try and work in any questions that come up that way. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time with our panelists. So we can't have a formal uh, Q&A uh, session. And, and just as a kind reminder that as much as we encourage critical discussion um, in the chat, we really do uh, want attendees to keep the conversation to be respectful, uh, to refrain from using profanity or any offensive language. Um, if not, then you know, we, we will be removing the, removing the chat. And just 
Uh, Laura didn't mention this, but today's discussion is being recorded and it will be available on uh, the Dalalana YouTube channel afterwards uh, with closed captioning in, uh, in a few days. Did also want to take this time to thank everybody who's helped uh, put this together, uh, those folks working behind the scenes, um, to thank Obadiah George in particular for all the help and Amy Katz, who's our uh, knowledge translation specialist. Um, and yeah, I think those are a few things, um, but otherwise I will um, also be inviting Ronaldo back later on for some of our questions. Um, but with that, I am now going to introduce our panelists. And so our first panelist, and I'll introduce them in alphabetical order, our first panelist is Ruha Benjamin. So Ruha Benjamin is a professor of Amer um, African American Studies at Princeton University. She is the, also the founder of the Just Data Lab. Uh, Dr. Benjamin specializes in the interdisciplinary study of science, medicine, and technology, race, ethnicity, and gender, knowledge, and power. She is the author of Race After Technology, the editor of Captivating Te uh, Technology, Race, Carcinal, Carcinal um, Technoscience, and Liberatory Imagination in Everyday Life, as well as numer numerous articles and book chapters. Welcome, Ruha. Uh, so our next panel, uh, Lana James is the AI Medicine and Data Postdoctoral Fellow at Queen's University. She's wrapping up her doctoral studies at the University of Toronto in the Faculty of Medicine. Um, yes, yay. Um, her work explores AI, clinical care, population health and, pu and public health policy and its particular implications for black life. Lana's current thinking and research can be found in the conversation, the Toronto Star, uh, the health, um, the AI health podcast and the web series COVID conversations, which is the first and longest running uh, pan-Canadian series on race-based data collection, AI, big data, privacy, ethics and equity in health. And you can find out more about this work at Ready for Black Lives. That is at R E D E for the number four Black Lives on Twitter. Welcome, Lana. And our final panelist is Pat Ocampo. Uh, so, Pat Ocampo is a social epidemiologist. She has conducted a number of longitudinal and cross sectional studies in areas of the social determinants of health. She has focused on methods development as part of her research, including application of multi-level modeling uh, to understand residential and workplace contexts. Um, and she's internationally renowned for her scholarship and methods development in social epidemiology and has received uh, career excellence awards from the US Centers of Disease Control, American Academy of Pediatrics, American uh, Public Health Association, and the U.S. Institute of Medicine. And Dr. Ocampo is the Canadian chair, a research chair in population health um, intervention research tier one. And so welcome everyone. I'm very excited for the conversation to hear your reflections and also just see, uh, see what else uh, you know, comes up uh, through the conversation. So I think a really great starting point is actually uh, to think and so it is big tech, data science, AI, and the university, what's at stake for Black life? And so just so our uh, attendees can get a better sense of who you all are and what you're going to be bringing to this conversation, I was really hoping uh, we could just get a little more information, particularly about if there was a project or a moment um, that kind of informs your thinking around this and any action. Um, that you've taken and to think about, you know, what's at stake uh, from your discipline or from your social position, as well as the different geographies. I think that's going to be a key piece of our conversation. So I would actually like to start with Buha on that. Absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone. It's such an honor to be in conversation with so many people who I've long admired and newly admired. 
Um, and this is my, my official reaction to Professor Walcott's talk is, <laughs> I really hope that we, I see people asking for the recording in the chat and I believe, truly believe that it's something that we all need to sit down with and study and dive into the full version um, of because it wove so many, it, he, he, he said two strands, but I'm pretty sure there was about six or seven strands up in there. Um, it was powerful. It was such a powerful diagnosis of uh, the, the complicity of the university in a way that I really haven't heard um, before. Um, two paraphrases stand out. The university sits at the epicenter of how information has been extracted. Black people are the inconvenient truth of the university. And so many more we could talk about from his start of historicizing buzzwords like evidence-based to his engagement with Leotard, the idea of science is the narrative. I think we could dwell on that and really think about the implications of that for our work. And then finally, for me, me most challenging is really to grapple with the complicity of the professorships um, in, in all of that. So not just the university writ large, but the different positionalities um, within the university. And so I just want to thank him for the the time and energy and insights that were poured into that um, that presentation. Um, I, I'll pick up on just one of those dozen strands um, when he remarked uh, that black people are needed and discarded. And uh, in terms of my own personal experience, it took me back to being a graduate student before I started race after technology and started thinking about these issues and questions in the context of the data sciences, I was researching uh, how power and inequality were shaping biotechnologies, specifically stem cell research. And two, two particular quotes have stuck with me all of these years, 15 plus years. The one, posed by a black sickle cell patient. Why am I in such demand as, as a research subject and not as a patient, right? Why am I in such demand as a research subject and not as a patient? This was a question, right? That why am I in such demand? It connects back to this longer history in which black bodies are valuable, but black people are disposable. And so we need to think about that dynamic in the context of data collection or extraction. Second quote, we want to be at the table and not just on the table of the life sciences. So here we begin to see again, a very, someone completely different, a health justice advocate in California that was doing my field work, articulating this dynamic of not having a say, not having any power to provide input in terms of the decision making, the questions that were being asked, this $3 million, uh, $3 billion investment in erecting an entire new state agency dedicated to the right to research, delivered by a, a ballot measure in which people went to vote for this proposition, voted it up, to invest this much money in research. And that very same ballot had a different measure on it, Prop 72. Prop 72 would have invested in expanding everyday healthcare access to the vast majority of Californians, and it was voted down. So you see, again, thinking about what imaginaries get to materialize an imaginary that then animates the constitution and erects an entire apparatus for the right to research, and yet an imaginary that could materialize everyday healthcare access to people who otherwise wouldn't have it, um, is completely squashed. And so then we come back to Walcott on Leotard, science is the narrative. Science is the imagination in which we are living. And so I, I offer those two kind of data points, we might call them those articulations of the tensions that we still live with now as a way for us to really think about how something can be wrapped in the language and rhetoric of the common good and the public good 
and yet not be animated by public values and certainly not values that would prioritize, again, in Walcott's um, insistence, the most marginalized, not just public in the abstract, but prioritizing those who are often situated in the underbelly of progress. And so I want us to really become more discerning about how these buzzwords and rhetoric um, infiltrate even our own speech when we write that grant, <laughs> when we frame that talk, <laughs> um, and begin to take stock of it and, and, and really understand the distance between the values and the everyday reality that people live. Thank you, Ruha. Um, I'm going to move right on to Lana, um, and I'm sure she'll have some uh, more to add and kind of link with, with what you said so far. Yes, uh, you know, uh, Ruha, I, I thought very similar things, and as well as, I mean, just picking out a few in terms of, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Walcott, for that talk, because you know, when I said, can you please speak to this area, I knew it was going to definitely be insightful and thought provoking, but you can never know what you're going to get. And it just, again, I'm with you on that one. Um, and in a good way, because so much thought in this area is not as expansive as it should be, um, or accountable or responsible, not only to the genealogies that we live out in our blood and in our communities, but also the academic genealogies that supposedly are supposed to provide the framing and infrastructure on how we go forth. So as someone who has to spend a lot of time looking at how disciplinarity and discipline both distort and push forward certain ideas in order to parse out what is actually the gold uh, versus the poisoning of mercury that gold leaves behind when it's extracted from the earth. It's It was a very helpful talk. And so I'm gonna pull on uh, two things. One, he spoke about um, the North Atlantic. And um, for folks that remember those political moves, there were ways in which in particular during um, the Harper administration, um, there was this need to kind of demarcate the North as Canada's terrain to show that uh, Canada was a big boy and they could stand up to the Russians and the Americans and, and that all that ice and snow was theirs um, rather than the belonging of, to the indigenous people who have not ceded it, I might point out. Um, and they, they did that show of force. So they could manage to get equipment up there and create a sense of occupation. Yet many of those communities were not getting what they were entitled to in relation to access to food in their own lands. So I, I thought that that was quite interesting when it was happening um, and interesting in the sense that it followed the narrative that when the nation state wants to deploy itself, um, it can always find a way to get it right. But when that is in the interest of the people, somehow they don't know how to get things up north in a fair, timely manner. So that juxtaposition was just jaw dropping for me at the time and that, that argument about the north continues, right? And it also brings to the environmental part. So for folks that um, may have been there in 2019, 20, 2019, 2019 November, I, I did a talk um, that looked at AI and kind of asked the question, like, let's look at this 360 because we keep getting presented these beautifully polished pictures of all white interiors um, where things just pop and float. Um, and that comment that when Dr. Walcott like brought into view the environment, one of the things I wanted to do in that talk was point out that the amount of environmental disaster that is required, not environmental impact, disaster and catastrophe, right? And here I want to support the work um, that uh, uh, Bedore, Dr. Bedore did the other day, as well as uh, Dr. Walcott on an, another uh, talk, and I encourage you to listen to that. And how it's being disappeared and suppressed from view so that we get so enamored with our phones and our computers and everything that we don't actually think about what does it take to get here? Like, what is that supply chain? And for those of you that actually read the introduction and you clicked on those hyperlinks, you see that what it's meant, for instance, for the Congo is a lot of dead children, a lot of maiming, um, and a lot of environmental disaster that cannot be prepared anytime in the next one or 200 years. Also that, you know, Apple and Microsoft and Gates and like all of these corporations can provide us with our searches, right? So in order to get that thing to pop up in Google, um, it comes from somewhere, like those materials come out of the earth. So I wanted to highlight that, 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 um, that gesture to the environment is so central because 
we are actually cannibalizing everything that we need to live because it needs to be in our computers. So the water, the air, and I thought that was amazing. And the other piece was around where he had kind of touched on, as uh, Ruha had also commented on, was how, how we become priests in this temple of worship of you know, technological determinism and how the university has become reinvested and reinvigorated itself as a shrine to the efficiency, unfortunately not of life, but actually of producing something very different that's more like harm and death because there's not this full 360 view. There's not this consideration for who's at the table, who should be, and who will be invited for a whole host of reasons. So those were some of the things I took out that I would love for data scientists and epidemiologists and analysts to really parse because part of how colonization works and in particular the technical sciences is they keep you focused right here. They don't want, you, they're like, it's like a horse race. They put your blinders on, you get locked into undergrad. And by the time you're in, for instance, my area in your PhD, you have to fight a whole lot of forces because I keep taking off my blinders and I'm like, so what went down there? And that is discouraged. So I really hope that we encourage people to do what needs to be done for us all to actually um, be fully present and not discounted before we even start. So hopefully that helps. Thank you, Lana. And I, I particularly that point around blinders and just being able, you know, to take them off. It, and it is that slow process of, of unlearning. Um, so Pat, yeah, I was wondering kind of how, how you come to this topic. Sorry, Pat, you're not, um, you're still muted. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, and I'm so pleased to be here with these great panelists and so enjoyed that talk. Um, I really wanted to hear the full talk uh, and uh, hope I get to uh, soon. Um, I may be the panelist, maybe with the least AI experience, but I am um, you know, a data professional uh, in that my work is in the line of social epidemiology. And I create and use data that feeds AI and other data science activities. Um, I so appreciated the comment that Ronaldo made about scientific knowledge being only one kind of knowledge and felt very grateful for narrative knowledge because we definitely need other things to balance what is generated through science. Um, you know, we all know what an epidemiologist is now that we're facing COVID-19, but not all may really understand what a social epidemiologist is. And I'd like to take just a moment maybe to make that distinction, as I do think it has implications for Black life and the study of Black life um, and how the field of epidemiology conceptualizes and studies Black life. Epidemiology is a field within public health and um, epidemiologic data is an important focus of many public conversations now about what data we need to collect to better understand COVID. We need race-based data to understand inequities. Um, and uh, it concerns me for many reasons. Uh, so much of public health, and that includes epidemiology, derives from the biomedical sciences and that can be very problematic when we're calling for data to be used by epidemiologists in that um, medicine is one of the only disciplines left that still holds on to the outdated and disproven notion that there are genetic or inherent biological differences by race. This remnant of another era, um, an era that used these scientifically supported ideas of inherent biological differences by race, to justify racist social policies is unfortunate. Um, epidemiology and medicine still have quite a bit of work to do to purge this notion from their science. And there's some movement in this area, but perhaps not enough and not fast enough. So is social epidemiology any different? Uh, and if so, how? You know, the answer is both yes and no. Social epidemiology studies um, the social determinants of population health, and therefore our focus is on social facts more so than biological determinants. So when social epidemiologists study race, they subscribe to a social definition of race, for example, how an individual 
might identify their own membership in a particular racial group or how individuals are racialized in our day-to-day -day lives. Yet the way we use race uh, in social epidemiology um, might look very similar to what an epidemiologist does. It's certainly oversimplified. Heterogeneity within group membership is not considered. Um, the priority seems to be comparing averages across different groups. And while social epidemiology claims to engage in social facts, it rarely studies those issues that uh, Ronaldo said were critically important. So we don't study systemic racism or colonization or capitalism itself. And we're just beginning to engage with politics and health. You know, one reason for this gap is that all of epidemiology primarily focuses on individuals and their characteristics. And we have a really hard time focusing on systemic issues. And I care about all of this because we're generating data that goes into AI and all those data science activities. You know, I'm also one of the senior members of this panel and have had um, kind of a long view on what has happened in the last three decades in the academy in terms of corporate influence and commercialization and, you know, private public partnerships, um, how that's affected science as a whole and the university in particular. And um, Ronaldo certainly referred to those trends as well. And I've seen how this um, very much this predatory approach by corporations and the privatization and push for academic entrepreneurship has shaped how we approach data and research and can point sadly to more downsides than benefits of corporate involvement. But these are the topics we're gonna to talk about um, on this panel today, so thanks. Thank you, Pat. And I, I kind of want to pick up on that a little bit um, and think about the partnerships between uh, big tech and the university, because they're always in, you know, introduced with great enthusiasm. Uh, we often have you know, words such as innovation, efficiency, improved outcomes. Uh, when you know we're hearing about big tech and and the university and Ruha, you've actually talked about this a little bit in, in your book, uh, Race After Technology, uh, where you uh, mentioned that these de um, developments are often framed as inevitable. Um, and I'm going to actually quote from your book. You say technology is often depicted uh, neutral or as a blank slate developed outside um, political and social context with the potential to be shaped or governed through human action. Um, and since we're gonna focus on healthcare and public health today, um, I think it's important for us to kind of point out the degree with which those um, partnerships claim to solve a range of public health problems. Um, and, and so today we're hoping to give uh, people tools to be able to distinguish between the narrative how things are framed about partnerships and what really is the reality. Um, so I was hoping, um, you know, and I'll probably, I think I'll start with you, Lana, but I was hoping in your view, you know, where do these narratives sit, you know, in relationship to reality? Like um, what concrete material effects do these partnerships have on, on Black life? And thinking particularly um, when I say Black life here, thinking about the work of Adil Abdullahi and uh, Ronaldo Walcott, uh, where you know they talk about their being, you know, expressed and circumscribed, and like the demands for Black people to be able to live full lives. Um, so, I, yeah, I appreciate just to hear your thoughts on that, Lana. Um, okay, so I think in terms of the partnership piece, um, the partnership piece is something that is we all need to think on. And so my thinking is hopefully just one strand of many and we'll hear from you know Ruha and Pat. Um, these, I, this idea of the public partner, part, public private partnership has a long history that we won't get into, but I'll just talk a little bit about what we need to think through. So there was a wonderful article written by a colleague of mine um, and I'm using that term directly as someone that I'm actually acquainted with and we discussed because I've been noticing I'm just going to do a little caveat, how colleague has come to be used, particularly in these spaces of AI, as a way to kind of say, oh, I get all the critical stuff because I'll call that person a colleague. So you don't have to actually keep your critical thinking hat when you're talking to me because I'm, I'm safe. 
versus um, actually saying you need to always be critical about what you're thinking, no matter whose name I call. So um, the article uh, was in Wired and uh, he's a computer scientist and Mohammed uh, did a, a scan of how many universities had um, their chairs or positions um, and their monikers around the campus. So your you know, Google Mind chair, your this chair, your that um, research institute. And what was interesting is it's, it's quite a strong prolifer proliferation given the sample size. And you know, he's looking further into that work. It says a lot when a field as I would say emergent as this one is having hundreds of millions of dollars being spent by lobbyists at all of our government's doorsteps. Um, and then we have a lobbying framework in Canada. You're supposed to sign in. I mean, it wasn't used, but you're supposed to use it. Um, but that doesn't happen at the academy. So there's no way really for you to figure out, is that just money? And what does that money look like in terms of what are the priorities, what events you're expected to attend, what words you're supposed to mind? So I think that when we think about public-private partnerships, we have to understand that business, as someone who has been in business, and I have no problem saying that, I've worked for the private sector, I've worked for the tech sector, I've been an executive, and I've been in the war room, and I've made product decisions, and they're not all cute, I'll tell you that. Um, I also still held my ethics and my ground, which is part of why I had to step back because I realized that these things don't align. And as I say, I was like really young, so I didn't totally understand everything, but I knew enough to know that something's not right here. And my intelligence and my brilliance is being used for purposes other than I would probably be comfortable with. So I literally packed up shop. The VP almost lost his mind because <laughs> I was one of the best people on the team. And I was like, I'm out. Um, and so I want to point that out to you that sometimes um, when it comes to things that don't line up, you will have to make a choice about what you're going to continue to do for a paycheck. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm a person that's pretty principled, so I'm pretty clear about what that is and what that isn't. But many people with privilege who don't look like me never have to make that decision in most of their life. And when it comes to the proliferation of AI and data science into their professional life, this might actually be the first time they have to do something. And so when we go to this question of public-private partnerships, I think this is one of those areas that many of us need to actually sit down and think about because the engagement is never without strings. The question is, are those strings strong enough to hang your ethics and stop them dead, full stop? And so the public-private partnerships have a number of ways of working. And so I'm gonna take an example and it's um, around how data science um, and datafication then get spun to look like positive, innovative ideas. And those of us who ask questions like, does it really work like that are said to have a half full glass, to be pessimistic, to not be open to progress, um, to be wanting to hold back when we should be leaping. And those are actually different ways of trying to suppress critical thought. And I think we need to re recognize that. So if you've ever heard those things, any of you out there that's trying to su suppress critical thought and your job is to be a thinking person. And I'm thinking here now of a perfect example of why public par private partnerships need to be explicitly laid out and parsed. And it's, I don't know if you can see this, but it's called uh, The Invisible Heart. It is a documentary that I actually was told about and saw when it, it screened um, downtown where the hot duck film festival usually is. And it was a, a movie on SIDS, Social Impact Bonds. And I really encourage you to watch this movie because this is where data science, datafication, corporate interests, and the university squarely put on the clothes of a compassionate being, but are being anything but compassionate. And even the people that say that there is some value in a SIB say that it's very specific, narrow context and do not support the broader broadcast. And, and I expect that they are being encouraged here and rolled out because I've had folks call me and ask me, what is this thing? It's being made to look good. Is it really? And I direct them to this movie and some other pieces. And so in summary, private public partnerships typically work for the private side and only work for the public side in as much as it supports the political party's agenda. 
So you can look at case after case after case, which I have. And what you'll find out is the public benefit isn't to the actual public. It's to the political parties that broker that relationship, right? And so we always, especially in AI and data science, where we're being asked to literally put our breast exams, right? Our tissues into massive data banks that will then be brokered by public-private partnerships. Um, that's something you have to really understand, but it doesn't mean that it's for your personal benefit. It's for profit because corporations have one singular goal. They are not like the public, right? The only goal of a corporation is to make profit at every and any cost. And that includes if it's illegal because they have departments for that. And we know that they calculate that in the cost of doing business. So I want to point you to the invisible heart. You should be able to find it online. And it's a very good example of how datafication works. And you can see how it's being marshaled to support the suppression um, and sustenance, sustaining um, class division and creating a multi-tier society in which the bottom just goes further down. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. And I'm Ruha, I'm wondering if like you could pick up on some of that, just like the pieces around profit. Absolutely. Um, I mean, one of the things I was thinking about with your question was how this relationship between big tech and the university has to be understood within the larger process of the corporatization of the university. And, and what came to mind was Wendy Brown's book called Undoing the Demos. And one quote in particular I'll just pull out um, in which she writes, the popular contemporary wisdom that a liberal arts education is outmoded is true only to the extent that social equality, liberty, and worldly development of mind and character are outmoded and have been displaced by another set of metrics, income streams, profitability, and technological innovation, end quote. So what does this have to do with black life? And Lana was getting us there with that example um, on the ground. And I'll just put one more kind of case study that really just sketching the broad contours of which to get us thinking about how these sort of abstract formulations when hit the ground. And so some of you may know already about a company called PredPol, which stands for Predictive Policing. And PredPol was actually the origins of PredPol, which is this US-based predictive policing system. Um, it starts at a university, UCLA, by an anthropologist, by a Canadian anthropologist. <laughs> and so here you have a patented algorithm derived directly from a model used to predict earthquake aftershocks, which the company uses to predict crime as if it were an, as natural as the weather. So I, I think there are many ways to unpack PredPol using the thematics of our conversation. Among other things, I just wanna highlight the academic origins of predictive policing um, and all of its racist um, afterlives, which lends it legitimacy. That is the academic origins lends it legitimacy. So if you go to PredPol's uh, website, you see all the predictable buzzwords about hard data and machine learning to predict uh, crime. And the other thing to note is that the origins are, quote, interdisciplinary, another buzzword, because we're bringing together mathematics, AI, criminology, anthropology. Of course, the mathematical, the reductive sort of mathematical formula are key to this recipe. And you can see how you can imagine a grant being written for this and how you can easily frame it as this wonderful interdisciplinary initiative. So again, interdisciplinarity is not a straightforward good. We have to think about what is the actual content of that and which disciplines are trumping others in terms of the originary questions that are animating these, these, these uh, technological interventions into social life. And so I'll leave it at that, but I just want us to understand, again, the stakes are high, or the stakes is high, <laughs> um, in terms of how these complicities between the academy, uh, tech companies, 
and uh, you know racist institutions um, are impacting our communities. Yes, um, and you know I think both of you have provided um, two examples or multiple examples from different contexts, and so I actually want to talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, thinking particularly a lot of times we see in public health this default um, to look to the U.S. And so I, I want to talk about that a little bit more and be able to just kind of tease that out in terms of, you know, what are the particular nuances? What are the histories we need to think about uh, in terms of the risks here in Canada and, um, you know, those in the U.S.? What do we need to be aware of and how can how can that be obscured a little bit when we automatically uh, default um, at, to, uh, to the state? Um, so, you know, I also want to bring Ronaldo back into the conversation now. Um, and so I think I'll let Lana start off and then kind of everyone go for it. Um, I'm going to keep it quick because I also want to hear what Pat has to say about this. Having um, lived in the U.S. and been born in the U.S. and then having had an experience here. So I think that'll be interesting as well. So in terms of the uh, piece around um, the histories and the nuances, I think that two things I want to highlight are um, this kind this not just as move to the US, but the absence of criticality about what is that move going to bring us. And so, you know, circling back to this idea of race based data, and now the newer language that tries to obscure it even further, which is equity based data, and there's no such thing, there's just data, honey. It's, like, it's not the same as ice cream, you can't, you can't do that. Because depending, as we saw in Ruha's example, you could be working on earthquakes, and, and, the, and the corporation sees it as a profitable opportunity. And the metrics that you use for an earthquake can now be transposed. Let's be clear, it's not just criminality, it's they believe they know where criminality lies and they're looking for ways to zero in on it because we know where earthquakes are likely to happen. We just want to know exactly where. So it's not this matter of finding, it's a matter of confirming. And so when it comes to race-based data, equity data, we need to understand that the people who are getting that data are, are not and cannot be trained into thinking compassionately. That's not their job. Right. So someone who decided to study computer science, for the most part, chose not to study occupational therapy. But now we're going to have a different kind of student showing up, one who may have actually studied occupational therapy or physical therapy or medicine. And now can also, because the university has a great bundled deal for you, become a data scientist simultaneously by going to this lovely institute. And I will be training at one this summer. So you see the contradictions right here on film. And so is that the race-based data equity is then also sucking up from the US 300 years of racial capitalism and a data regime that has effectively managed not only to keep white supremacy well and alive, but allowed for the January 6th coup at Capitol. Because let's be clear, all those cameras were working and as we have come to see through reports, the people who manned those cameras stepped back hmm? when it was time for a particular kind of white supremacist business to be done. And I bring this point in because all over the world, I have a little tracker where I'm looking at the countries that have economic impact on black life, where their political regimes are. Are they to the right, the extreme right? And I'm sorry to tell you, but it's gone from right of center to extreme right. That is the majority of people, when I say people, countries who have voted in leaders who have political and economic power to negatively affect Black life are primarily being led by national leaders who sit far right of center, who actually support particular kinds of ethnic cleansing, as we saw with right across the border, right, who actually told people to storm the Capitol. And so we have to understand that the university is not a neutral place. The corporations that fund and support these super PACs in Canada, we call them by different names, and the US are not from another planet. The, those are the same people who are asking for your data and processing it, as we saw in Ontario, where our own premier is seen in photo shot, shot photo, photo, photo ops, um, posing with white supremacists, as well as some of the national leaders. So we have seen not only our premier, our prime minister take blackface, not only our premiers be in bed with white supremacists, we've seen corporations who actually hold military contracts for these regimes 
all together in the same boardroom. So when we talk about race-based data and equity data and people act like we're in, I don't know, Wizard of Oz, we have to remember there is a man behind the green curtain um, and that that data is not going to a neutral place. Some of the greatest data protections we need are actually in fact from our own government, from our own democratic government, not just some spooky corporation. Um, and so we need to actually think about what do we mean when we want to use race-based and ethnicity data and we want to datify and we want to take every medical metric and put it in a computer at the behest of anyone. We have to understand that this is not a neutral plane. There are political forces that can curry that data. And, you know, I'm going to take people back in time to World War II and the list and Latin America and the list. The list is the, is the process where there is a call. We need to know where all the Black people are. And historically, you'd have to use the census data. But now, thanks to the advocates that haven't thought about the whole process, it literally could happen in milliseconds. So I just want to flag for you that when you're taking up race-based data or ethnographic data or the datification of the body, because I work on oncology, there's some really complex questions. I hope we can get into them that I'm working on when we're looking at inside of the body for like where cancer is and taking images is that we actually pick up an entire racial capital regime that has honed itself to use that data in a militarized way. And I would point out to you that our top data company that are operating in Canada, the big six are all US, are now the civilian arm of the US government and several other regimes that now outpace the actual technology that the military itself is producing. So there's nothing neutral in health data. There's no such thing. There's just data. So I'll leave it there. And Pat, I'm hoping that you can give us mm -hmm. your thoughts from having been on both sides of this. Sure. Um, I have so many thoughts going through my head based on what you said uh, just now and also uh, in response to the other question. I guess, you know, one thing as a scientist, um, it feels uh, strange that uh, we are entering into these partnerships uh, or we're allowing this more predatory behavior by private interests uh, to uh, inquire about our data or take our data um, and just accepting the assumptions that they put on the table. Um, you know, scientists have to do a whole lot of justification uh, to convince their peers of the quality of their science. But when we enter into these partnerships, we just accept these assumptions like, um, you know, private corporations are into doing this because they want to contribute to the public good. And you already told us that they um, that they don't that they don't want to do that. They're there for their profit motive, uh, that they're not being very transparent. You know, we have to declare all of our conflicts that they don't have to, as you pointed out. But I think more importantly that um, as scientists, we're not really uh, challenging these assumptions. Um, I thought that that's what we were good at is challenging assumptions and being able to speak our mind in universities uh, so that we can figure out what is going on um, instead of buying into these assumptions. And I find that really concerning. When you talk about the US, I mean, I think there's a lot of lessons that we don't want to learn from. Uh, you know, when we're talking about healthcare, healthcare data, uh, we know that, um, you know, the U.S. has, uh, speaking of infections, they have a more vi virulent form of capitalism there than in Canada. So it's a lot looser. They have easier access to data and uh, taking those data and using them to make profit. Uh, instead of ensuring that they're using it for the well-being of the population. And so it's definitely problematic there. And of course, healthcare there is for-profit healthcare. And so we don't want to adopt those models here. Um, I also think it's important um, for us to keep in mind that, um, well, <laughs> We, 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 we probably won't be able uh, to stop the, uh, the private interests. We haven't been able to, but um, I think that there are ways that we can do it. We can um, ensure that we're uh, at the table as equal partners, that we don't 
uh, hand over the power that we have. You know, right now we have the data. And so um, we need to do a better job of just not accepting those assumptions and questioning them and uh, making sure that we're staying true to what, uh, what, why we're doing it. You know, I think there's a lot of scientists who really uh, want these challenging problems that we're mentioning solved. Perhaps they buy into or are lured by these ideas that we're told that, you know, the answer is simple. We just need more data, bigger data. Bigger data is better. And if we have bigger data, we're going to be able to solve the problem. Well, in fact, the problem is political. The problem is systemic racism. That's the real cause of inequities. And big data is not going to solve the problem. So we need not to fall victim to the lies that we're told. Thank you, Pat. Um, and Ronaldo, I want to bring you in because I am mindful of time and there's so much good stuff going on here. So please keep going. Oh. I just want to make one small point here because yes, time is running. Um, I think one of the things that, that we see around the question of data is the massive gap between the collection of data and policy implementation, which is one of the reasons why myself and Edel Abdullahi were interested in kind of, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a little bit corny, the notion of the black press, but it, it, it was an attempt to kind of, if you will, queue up that, queue up and, 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 and spectacularize that, that gap. And so I think that, I think that sometimes people hear us saying, we shouldn't collect data. And, and, and you get the other side of the argument where people are saying, well, we need data so that they can make good policy. And part of what we see is that we get data about black people, we get data about black poor people, we get data about um, black people who are living in some of the most extreme forms of, of distress to put it that way. And, then policy and policymakers disappear. They literally disappear from the scene. So in the chat, people are asking questions about COVID and so on. For instance, at the, at the level of the city of Ontario, at, at the level of the city of Toronto, we knew that Black and other non-white people were experiencing the impact of COVID in, in, in disproportionate fashion. And it took weeks and months before we could even get one center where people who were living under uh, conditions that were not uh, that were conducive for the for the constant spread and reinfection to occur, where they can go and isolate. It took months, even though we knew that those centers would help to interrupt the problem. And similarly, that um, we are still engaged in a debate about whether or not people should have paid sick leave. We are still engaged. So we've got all the, we, got, we know who's dying. We know who's been, who's, who's been infected. We know who's suffering, but the people who make the decisions. And so, and, and, and so what happens is we, we find ourselves on this treadmill. And, and so for, for, for my intents and purposes, uh, as I wrote some, some weeks ago for that Royal Society racialized um, that data is very much a political issue. It's a political problem. And, and the question is, when we've got to data, do we, do we actually have the power and the mechanisms to power to make things happen? And for Black people, that's usually no. <laughs> Sadly so. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think to your point, the question becomes, what are we, what are we trying to do with this data? And does it really respond to ask from the community and is this really the the way to go and I think a few people you know are asking about like what what do you do uh, but I'd also want us to think about like we don't have to there are multiple ways we can collect data it does not need to be through the state and for us to actually think about other ways of of actually collecting data of it being owned by us and so really would love to know your thoughts about that and also thinking about what are the you know, the possibilities of, you know, intervening and disrupting and interrupting what's happening in this moment. 
And I, anybody really, to be honest, <laughs> who wants to go for it, maybe, maybe Ruha. All right, I'll give it a stab. I mean, you know, I, I, I think um, we place a lot of hope in the idea that data will save us. That if we just get the right data, just get enough data, and to, uh, you know, Ronaldo's point, um, oftentimes we know things already. <laughs> we know the state of reality and data becomes a stall tactic or the calls for more data becomes a stall tactic on acting on what we already know. It's what I call the datafication of injustice. And so that's one thing to keep in mind is that so we could have told, if you sat a group of sociologists and historians down last February, <laughs> We could have told you how it would have unfolded in terms of the communities that are impacted, the death toll, et cetera, et cetera. We didn't need million dollar grants to go and confirm the, the, the pattern that we know has taken shape. So that's point number one. And so the question becomes, what then is lacking? What are we missing in terms of the political will, the resources, the power in order to enact the changes that we know we need and we and we could um, make happen. One of the things I want to point out is if we again scan the world in terms of the different responses to COVID, one of the variables that have been so pronounced as you look across different contexts is the variation in public trust for government to act in the best interest of the body politic. Mm -hmm. And I want to suggest that in terms of the complicity of public and private partnerships, what we've been referring to throughout this conversation, how those partnerships have such a central role in eroding trust. And one example of many I could point to that a team of my students have been working on at the Just Data Lab here um, is that the Department of Health and Human Services in the U.S. awarded a $25 million grant to a company called Palantir which is, again, for those who don't know, a Silicon Valley data aggregation company that's infamous for its ties to law enforcement and immigration enforcement. If you put a, you know, if you want a picture next to the word surveillance in the dictionary, it would be Palantir. And yet this is the company that has been awarded a grant and other, you know, other partnerships along the way by different government agencies. So is it any wonder that racialized communities are going to be skeptical about public health surveillance tools when this is the company, among others, who are developing contact tracing and developing other interventions. And so, again, we have to think about how the thing that is really, you know, a foundation for the glue for holding anything called society together, this thing called trust is being daily eroded through these types of partnerships that continue to fly in the face of the reality that communities have bore witness to in terms of the violence of, of an organization like ICE partnering with Palantir. And then you give Palantir the grant to develop the pandemic response. Again, we could have sat down with a, a small group of people a year ago and really informed on how this would happen. Uh, we didn't need more data in order to do that. I'm going to jump in and I'm going to tag you as I jump in, Pat, so just like jump in while I'm talking in it. And the reason I'm saying I'm calling on you, Pat, is because Palantir, I, Ruha, you could not have picked a better example. I was actually just talking um, to a, an American who's on the Hill, who's been monitoring some of these very concerning um, contracts that have been dispensed. And so I'm just going to rewind. So for folks that did attend uh, the COVID conversations there, we actually interviewed uh, Jack Polson, who's part of Tech Inquiry. And uh, his commitment is to like keep track of this and make sure that the public understands um, how it works. And so I had actually just checked in with him to get an update because I had been reading some articles. So I'm going to rewind. So last year, Palantir for $1, for anybody who knows business knows why we use $1, that's to make it a commercial transaction and therefore exempts it from other domains, gave $1 to the National Health Service of uh, the United Kingdom to access all of their health records. So they went in and had access to everyone's personal health records. Then they reappeared this year, and you can just look it up online, and they then 
were awarded a fairly substantial contract because now they've been able to parse the entire infrastructure, which historically you do an RFP and you have to do it with the data that's available to the public. But this contractor instead, through their $1 purchase, had the entire infrastructure, all the data files accessible, turned around, got a contract that not only allows them to um, manage their border services, but also invest themselves into the networking of the public health care system. And we, all, we know that British, the, the British, the United Kingdom, particularly, I'm thinking about England and, and the cities, have big issues around anti-Black racism, anti-Islamic sentiment, like people are physically being accosted in the street, especially since Brexit. So it's quite interesting. And then here's the next piece. Palantir flips back around. And if you look in the newspaper, you will find them having gotten a very large, juicy contract with guess who? The U.S. military industrial complex. And so what we were actually seeing of Palantir is already what your big six, the people in your phone, the people on your search engine, the people providing you apps have already done. So many of the companies that we know as those geeky white boys who were just doing this innovative thing, who gave us these really cool tools have now turned into exactly what they talked about, right? Um, and their companies, if you look at their revenue stream, this is why they've now been saying, oh, we're not gonna do the click ads and we can, because their business model is now plugged directly into these massive contracts with regimes, the US and otherwise, who not only wage war globally, but also on their citizens. And this is why you saw so much action of tech workers unionizing because they did not want to be part of a death machine, right? And so I come to you, Pat, to say, what do, you know, this is the way the work of epidemiologists and social epidemiologists are being used because often you're contracted or asked to work on a problem by a provincial government, a municipality or a national government. You're attending to the problem, I would assume as someone who cares. But in fact, the people behind the curtain are the Palantirs and the Googles and the Bezoses and the Microsofts who seem to be doing really simple things like giving me Microsoft Word, but in fact, are doing something very different. So what might you say to data scientists and epidemiologists like yourself who are not paying attention to these very important critical things that journalists are actually losing their careers over? Yeah, I have a lot to say to them, but uh, um, <laughs> I, you know, I think, so I'm trying to balance between sort of piling on all the problems that we've talked about, because we've talked about really important problems and then maybe having a shining a little bit of light on some positive ideas here about data. Um, you know, there are, uh, yeah, Palantir and all of those groups really scare me. I think uh, in the past couple of decades too, you know, science has moved um, in the direction to make it much easier for them to get it. So journals, for example, now require us to make our data available publicly. Um, funders of um, grants uh, and people who generate data are now making us um, have uh, data be uh, publicly available. And I think that just makes it easier for these organizations uh, to access our data, even without our permission, which is really scary. Um, maybe uh, one positive note is uh, there are times when we do a really bad job of collecting data. So maybe they're getting bad data. And I realize that one of the consequences of that is that a lot of harm is done and we can't take that lightly, but not all data is the same. I think that a lot of our conversations are really about the surveillance type data, which say, oh my God, let's look at those gaps between this population and that population. And the gaps are terrible, but that's all it tells you. I think what we really want, first of all, is to partner with these communities um, and put them, um, if not in the passenger seat, in the driver's seat about what they find important. But I would like to see more focus on collecting data about solutions and about the interventions. So, and it's a totally different type of data. It's not about demonstrating gaps. Just because we know one group is doing better or worse than another, doesn't tell us anything about how we should intervene. How do groups want to interact with interventions? What interventions do they want? What are they asking for? Um, uh, what are their barriers to accessing interventions? What does equity look like? 
to them. Let's co-design it. Let's collect that kind of data. Let's hear from a whole bunch of people about how they want to um, engage in interventions and how much, um, et cetera. That data we don't have right now. Let's spend money on designing solutions. Let's spend, mon let's spend money on uh, collecting data to design solutions rather than a lot of this surveillance data, which is often quite limiting, um, often quite harmful. Uh, and I think if we did it in partnership with the affected populations, we'd have a better chance of generating something good. I'm not saying it will work um, because we know how powerful the, um, you know, the private sector is and we're handing over control to them through those mechanisms that I just said. But um, we would have a chance of generating something that is more useful if that was our focus. And I think it's really important to highlight that, Pat, just the power asymmetries that are present um, and really thinking through what are the ways we can design um, either data collection and maybe also moving it away from the university um, ultimately because we have to keep those asymmetries um, present, uh, you know, top of mind uh, when, when we are thinking about this. I realize we are really running out of time now and want to just provide um, an opportunity for final reflections. There are so many things we didn't get into and we noticed there are a lot of chat um, messages in the chat. So hopefully at some point we can go and look at those. But you know, also thinking about alternatives. I see Ruha, you provided some suggestions there, but want, wanting to also think about organizing um, and what are those possible points to really rethink and like interrupt what's going on at the moment. Um, and so Ronaldo would love to hear your thoughts on this. Okay, I'd like to, to, to conclude by picking up where, where Pat was just concluding and, and to say something about, you know, in the, in the first eventful moments of the internet, we had a different conception of what we thought it might be. We actually thought that it might provide us the opportunity to experience freedom in a radically different way, freedom from our bodies, freedom from gender, freedom from race, you know. And, and instead, um, what we've seen is that it has somehow reinforced some of the most essentialist qualities about what it might mean to be human. And, you know, people search you out to figure out whether or not you're a black, you're a male. Like, you know, in the, in the early 2000s, I used to teach these courses on, on, on new, what we used to call at the time, new media and communications. You know, the work of Sandy Stone and, 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 figures, and figures like that. And that particular kind of orientation to thinking about what the digital realm might have done has entirely disappeared. I, I, maybe I shouldn't exaggerate it in that way, but it, it, it has morphed into something else. And part of what we've seen, of course, we know the origins, of, a particular account of the origins of the internet, which, you know, begins, interestingly enough, at that moment of neoliberalism and Ronald Reagan's desire for something called Star Wars. Mm -hmm. uh, right, a shield that might. So the back and forth between the military industrial complex and, and these infrastructures shouldn't surprise us. But I think that when Ruhar invoked the work of Wendy Brown and the Demos, like the digital Demos was supposed to offer us an out from all of that. And instead what it has done or what it has at this moment it has been able to do is to, main the, is to retain the on the unequal distribution of resources and, and to hold white supremacy, global capitalism in place in a, in a really sturdy way. So the alternative that is really at stake is how are we going to organize collectively to live better together differently? And I think it begins with the kinds of things that Pat was pointing to and the kind of resources that, that, that Ruhar posted around you know, big tech companies that don't pay taxes and, and, and so on. But I think it also begins in some smaller spaces. Our colleague Camille Oakridge asked a question, asked a similar kind of question. And, and her question prompted me 
to remind to remind her that, for instance, when HIV AIDS began to impact communities, black communities in Toronto in the 80s, early 90s, black communities seized resources, demanded resources to begin to look after themselves in relationship to HIV. What's happening now is that the kinds of data and demands for data that are being collected are divorced from that kind of opportunity for communities to seize resources and shape the surroundings that might be necessary for them to shape for their own survival. So part of, part of what we have to do is not to see um, data collection as, as a route towards inclusion into a system that is already predicated on Black people being always already data, and therefore not able to shift that shift that 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 infrastructure. We have to begin to imagine an outside to that, and an outside is possible. We had we had that imaginary in the early two thousands before Silicon Valley really emerged and really captured or recaptured what it is that the digital and the information. A, a, and a potential information commons could be, and we have to find a way to return to those kinds of logics, uh, both practically and, and conceptually. And uh, that's 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 how I'll end for the day. <laughs> Thank you, Ronaldo. Ruha. I've been, been in case we were running, running out of time. time I've been dropping, dropping all my last minute <laughs> thoughts in the chat, and so the, the last thing I guess I'll just say in thirty seconds is that I understand the hunger and desire. To, um, to talk about the way that we can appropriate data collection and marshal it for justice and to counter oppressive regimes, shining a light on the powers that be and all the good things that we can do. But I just want in that impulse to call for that positive, happy ending, I want also to note that many people still don't understand and have yet to understand the many forms of data violence. And so we're constantly being bombarded with how technology is going to save us. So for us to carve out an hour and a half, one little day of the week in order to unpack that and diagnose that is, is vital. And we can always have follow-up conversations. And there's so much wonderful work happening on the ground. But I would urge us not to try to jump to the happy ending. Pat? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to be grateful for all of the panelists' comments today and uh, for everything that they shared. And um, I have nothing else to share. Thanks. And thank you for the people who attended and provided great comments. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, Lada, do you want to maybe have the final word? Um, there were a lot of things going on in the comments that I was trying, the chats that I was trying to like digest, but unfortunately I'm not that multitasky. Uh, but I did want to come back to those kinds of questions that always surface um, for folks around like, is there not a way to get the data that, is there no data that can help us and is it all bad? And so again, I think to the point that was made, there are many different kinds of data. So for me, as someone who is both in bioinformatics um, and, you know, the more variety version of data science, there's a lot of data that I, I have to use and that I will use and that I must use, especially when we're talking cardiology, oncology, and all these areas. They're not all the same data. They don't all do the same things. And they're not all as interesting to all the corporations in the same level of priority in terms of what they want to grab versus what they think is garbage on the plate. And so one of the reasons, you know, I do the work with Ready for Black Lives, and you'll see another series coming through um, this spring, is to kind of help us understand, like, what are the different kinds of data? What is the, what's the anatomy of a data ecosystem? Because one of the problems we have right now, as you said, before we jump to the happy ending, is that people don't actually understand how data works and how business works, which is why, you know, when Laura opened, you know, I was asked to do this because often we can't easily connect the two. So we don't actually always understand what's being prioritized, particularly as people working in the data. So sometimes we're like, I wonder why they asked for that. But if you understand business, you know darn tootin well. Um, so there are many instances where data scientists have asked me questions and I've been like, ooh, are you comfortable with A, B, or C? And they're like, no. And I'm like, that's what you're being asked to do. So you've got some thinking to do. So it's important to know that we don't know things 
and that what we don't know can't just hurt you, but can get you killed, right? And that there is a very large machine that doesn't have the same concerns about either of those two options because it'll never be them. And so it's really important for us to learn what that ecosystem looks like and then parse, is this the way, the datafication way, the best to do it? And I will always say that we are humans with human problems and we only have tools. So if you want the best solution, it's going to come from hashing it out with another human, simply taking your accountability and dropping it into a database is never gonna get you an affordable answer. It's gonna get you an expensive problem. And so, yes, there is data that's useful, but you need to talk to the people that are critical thinkers around data. And as Pat said, the communities that will be affected by it. And then we need to bring the people who are in business and the NDAs who are gonna be honest and help us understand how to construct that so it serves our interests and doesn't exacerbate the power asymmetry, right? And that is the trick. If you're gonna play the data game, you can't play it so that you're showing all your cards. And here I'm gonna to go to Kenny Rogers, one of my favorites. You gotta know when to hold them and you gotta know <laughs> when to fold them. And if you don't understand data infrastructures in business, you're playing a game, you can't win, and you're at a poker table, you've already lost that. And unfortunately, that's how we're traditionally positioned when we're not the ones on top of society. So please, I encourage you, just take a step back like I had to in IT. I mean, I gave up a whole shitload of money and power. Um, I went back to not-for-profit and I entered this because I saw the confluence. Would I rather hide under my bed? Yes, but I'm not gonna, right? And I don't think any of us can shy away. So I encourage you to join us for our upcoming series. I encourage you to join the data cluster here where some difficult conversations and difficult because we've never been encouraged to have them, not because they're hard to have. So we had a great time and I wanna say thank you to all the panelists for accepting the invitation and for the data cluster and for Laura and Lori and Sarah and all the people behind the scenes at uh, uh, Dalalana who helped us uh, get this thing done for the data cluster. Yes, and I also wanna say thank you. Thank you to Ronaldo, to Bruja, Lana, Pat, like really this has been an amazing conversation. I know there's so many pieces that we didn't even get to touch upon. Um, also want to, you know, take a moment to thank uh, Steven Huang, who's the director of uh, the MAP Center for Urban Health Solutions, for really um, supporting this initiative with the Knowledge uh, Translation Specialist. As, Matt, uh, as Lana mentioned, there were so many people who were helping behind the scenes, uh, helping with creating questions. Um, and yeah, I guess I want to say thank you for everyone who attended. Uh, we realize it's a Wednesday afternoon and we really appreciate you taking the time and really, you know, hope this is the beginning of uh, many conversations to come. And so have a wonderful afternoon and please stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you.